Praise the Lord. Peace and greetings to you all once again in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, of course, you know me as Brother Clinton. And this is the Word Prophet Channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. It was he who said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, we who belong to Jesus Christ, we, we obey what Jesus says. And so that's why I'm here, and I hope that's why you're here with me. Welcome. If you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, and I hope you do, please open up with me to Ezekiel chapter 38. And while you're doing that, I just want to share with you a few things to kind of preface this message. In the world today, there's a lot of deception. And those of us who are Christians, we know that. That's not a, a new thing for us. It's not a surprise. There has been deception in the world ever since the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden. But as we go through the process of time, it seems evident that the, the greatness of the deception is increasing rather like a snowball rolling downhill, getting bigger and heavier as it goes along. And in these last days when there is so much going on, um, I'm speaking to you in the month of January, the year of our Lord, 2024, 5784. And over the last couple of months, there has been a war that has erupted on purpose in Israel with involving a proxy army that Israel created, which is called Hamas. And there are a lot of false teachers in the churches, which have been cranked out by seminaries, who are teaching people that all of this fits into prophecy. And you know how like people take the pieces of a puzzle and they try to f make the pieces fit where they're not supposed to fit just out of frustration because they just want to get the puzzle done? Well, that doesn't work very well. Um, but when you put the pieces of a puzzle together the way that they're supposed to be, then they all fit perfectly. And the picture comes out perfect as it was intended to be. And so there's a lot of people today who are very confused, and these people belong to something that is referred to as the mainstream. What is the mainstream? Mainstream is the broad path that leadeth unto destruction. Jesus said, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And he said in a different place, Broad is the gate, and or pardon me, broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And the reality of the matter is, according to the scripture, that way more than 99% of people that profess to be Christians are lost and hellbound, and they will not enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because they're not doing what Jesus said. Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, but the people that of all the people that profess to be Christians, the people that actually do what Jesus said to do by continuing in his word and being his disciple are very, very few. As he said, straight is the way and narrow is the gate which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So the vast majority of the people that profess to be Christians are in this thing that we call the mainstream. Actually, they call it the mainstream. Jesus calls it the broad path. And the mainstream consists of all the Catholic and Protestant churches who are all part of the same family. And these people are all taught by men who graduated from seminaries. These men are not Christians. They are theologians. And seminaries are not Christian institutions. They're Catholic institutions. They're called seminaries because they're invented for the purpose of inseminating. You see, so people that don't know God, they go to a seminary they pay the money, they get a degree that says that they supposedly have a doctorate of divinity, which thing is perfectly ridiculous, and then they buy or rent a building and call it a church and put a title over the door and they start a business and they get, you know, a, a 501c3 uh, thing with the, with the beast. And so they're in business and they use the word of God as they were taught in seminary to entertain people for money. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's what they do. And that's where most people that profess to be Christians get their beliefs from, either from going to a church like that or reading books by those people that profess to be pastors or prophecy teachers or whatever. And so there's a lot of lies that are being taught in the churches among all these people in the mainstream that they think 
are what the Bible says because they go to church and their pastor opens the Bible and he quotes a verse of the scripture and then he closes the book and he makes up a story and everybody in the in the church just says amen amen because they don't know the Bible they, they've never read their Bibles they haven't done what Jesus said if ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free see they haven't done what Jesus said they just go to church and then they say well my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible because the verse that you know the sermon that he spoke today was based upon a verse of the scripture so they think that they're getting bible teaching well they're not they're getting jesuit teaching because seminaries were instituted by the jesuits and are controlled by the jesuits every single one of them it doesn't matter which one it is it doesn't matter if it's a catholic seminary or a protestant seminary it doesn't matter if it's a baptist seminary or a pentecostal seminary or a lutheran seminary it doesn't matter they're all from the same organization, and each one of them has a lie for you, depending on which denomination you choose to adhere to. But Christians don't go to seminary. Christians don't use theology. Christians don't have theology. Christians believe the Word of God. It is written, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God are the words that came forth from him, which are written in this book, Holy Bible, King James Version, if you speak English. And so this is the seed from whence we were begotten, and this is the milk and the meat uh, of, uh, upon which we feed daily. And so this word is in us. It's, it's part of us. That's, that's why Jesus said, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. You see, those of us who are Christians, we're baptized into Jesus Christ, and we have his Spirit dwelling in us. See, his Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. The Holy Ghost is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was, he was in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus said, the Father is in me. See, and he said, I am in my father because he was baptized in the Jordan River and the heavens were opened. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So that's how Jesus was in his father and the father was in him. And so if, if we're Christians, then we're in him by being baptized in his name. And he's in us because we've received of his spirit, which, of course, causes us to speak with other tongues and prophesy. See, that's how we become Christians. And so Jesus is in us and we are in him. Praise the Lord. But. There is this thing called the mainstream, where people go to seminaries and learn all the nonsense and lies and witchcraft that they teach in seminaries. The Jesuits teach them in seminaries. And then they take this garbage into the churches, the denominational churches, or sometimes I call them the church businesses. And they teach this nonsense and garbage and witchcraft, theology it's called, to the people in these churches. And the people in these churches come with their Bibles and they open up their Bibles and they see the verse that the pastor is going to preach from. And then they all close their Bibles, and he tells a story, and they all say, Amen. And he's lying to them, and none of them know, because they've never read their Bibles. They haven't done what Jesus said. So what are these lies that are being taught in the churches today? Well, some examples are um, there, that there's supposedly going to be a seven-year tribulation. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. There's not going to be a seven-year tribulation. There's going to be a tribulation, the great tribulation, and the Bible says repeatedly that it's going to last for three and a half years. 42 months, 1,260 days. You see, it's the Bible is very exact about it and it says it repeatedly. Um, these people are also being taught a lie that supposedly there's going to be a seven-year peace treaty signed with Israel and between Israel and the Antichrist. Um, that's a fable. There is absolutely nothing written in the Bible that says anything like that. It's a complete fable. Um, these people are also taught that there's going to be a rapture and that one day just... Millions and millions of people are all going to disappear from the earth. And all little children up to a certain age, which nobody seems to know what age that is, are all going to disappear. And, um, you know, everybody's just going to disappear and their clothes are going to be left there. And planes are going to crash and buses are going to crash. And, and it's going to be mayhem and havoc and all that stuff. And that's just a fable. It's a fable. No such thing is ever going to happen. You see, the time will come when the dead in Christ will rise, and those of, us, those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those of us, those of us who are Christians, baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, and walking in his word, waiting for his coming, that's going to happen to us. But there's not going to be any rapture, you see, and there's no such thing as accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And the people that think that they are rapture ready have never obeyed the gospel of Christ, and so they're hellbound. They're hellbound. They're hell ready. Yeah, they're ready for the fire of hell because they've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But those deceptions are not the particular ones that I'm here to speak to you about. I've been speaking for almost 10 minutes, so let's get to the point, Brother Clinton. Okay. Um, because of the things that are happening today, there are a lot of people that think that, pardon me, that the events that are happening currently in Israel are leading up to something that they refer to as the Gog and Magog War. The Gog and Magog War is a reality. It's something that's spoken about in the scripture. That's why I had you open to Ezekiel chapter 38, and I hope that you're there by now. But it's not what they think, and it's not when they think. And the reason that it's not what they think or when they think is because they haven't done what Jesus commanded. They haven't read his word. The vast majority of people that are talking about this Gog and Magog war are people that have never even read about it in the Bible. They've never even read a Bible. It's obvious that they've never read a Bible because of the things that they're saying. I don't mean this to pick on anybody or to slander anybody. I'm just stating an obvious truth. Call me Captain Obvious if you want. But if someone is speaking about things that are obviously not what is written in the Bible and they profess to be Christians then that tells me that they've never read a Bible. So let's do what Jesus told us to do. I have my Bible open to Ezekiel chapter 38, and I would love to, to just go through every, every word of chapters 38 and 39 with you, but that would make for a long video. So I'm not going to do that here. However, if any of you have questions concerning the content of these two chapters, you're welcome to place a comment below or write to me an email. My email is always right below in the information box. But I'm going to read some portions of these two chapters, and I'm going to show you some things that are going to cause you to understand, if you believe God's word, that what is being taught in the mainstream denominational churches today about the Gog and Magog war is a complete and total lie. And it's very important that you understand this. So may God bless the reading of his word. Let's begin in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now let's stop there for a moment. I personally have, over the course of the years that I've been serving the Lord, on many occasions, done research on these names and where they are in the scripture, and indeed they can be found in the book of Genesis and other places in the scripture. However, I have not been able to make a connection or draw a line, if you will, between those names and who those people are, the tribes that they came from, to draw a line between that and the future from now and where exactly those nations are. Now, a lot of people think that it's Russia, Turkey, uh, I, you know, people say a lot of different things. I don't know. I don't know exactly where geographically these nations are or will be in the future, okay? For, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's difficult, for me at least, to draw a line between the revelation of these names in Genesis and current days or even in the future. And number two, because it's possible that these names pertain to people or nations in the future that aren't necessarily the same as the ones that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. It's possible. I'm not saying that that's the case. I'm just saying that remains a possibility. So the bottom line is for me as a minister of Jesus Christ that I don't know where geographically these nations are exactly. And it's not given to me to know. That's the, the conclusion that I have come to. Because if it was given to me to know, then I would know. But it's not given to me to know. So I don't know. All I know is what's written here in the scripture. So I'm not going to profess to tell you that Gog and Magog are this country or that country. Okay, I'm not going to profess to tell you that. We, we can see in the scripture that it, there's a reference to the north. So to the north of Israel, there's several different countries. Okay, but we don't know exactly which one this is talking about. And me, for me personally, I don't really think that's relevant right now. Uh, for me personally as a Christian, when this comes to pass, a little over a thousand years from now, which is when it will come to pass, and we'll see that as we read through the scripture, at that time, we will know. But for right now, I don't really perceive that it's important for us to know geographically what nations these are, because these things don't pertain to this time that we live in. And that's what I'm about to show you from the scripture. So let's continue. Verse 4. 
And I will turn thee back. Well, let's start in verse 3 again. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Okay. This is very important that we pay attention to what's going on here. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. And there we have a reference to the north quarters again. It's a very vague reference. It doesn't say exactly geographically where it is. It just says the north quarters. And that's sufficient for us to know. That's what's given to us to know, so that's what we know. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. This is speaking to, this is God telling Ezekiel to prophesy these things. God is addressing these two nations, Gog and Magog, whatever nations they may be. Verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. After many days thou shalt be visited. This is a clue. Okay. In the latter years, another clue, in the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now, at this point, let me just make a parenthetical statement. Prior to making this video, this very night, I made a different video, and it's kind of like the first of a two-part series. The first video is important for you to watch and understand so that you can understand this video. The first video was called uh, Israel is not gathered yet or something like that. Let me just move stuff around on my screen here so I can see it. It's called Israel has not been gathered yet. Um, and it's about the fact that Israel has not been gathered yet and the fact that people think that since 1948, the fact that Israel became a nation was the fulfillment of prophecy, that's a deception. That's a deception. Um, that prophecy has not been fulfilled yet. And if you'd like to know more about that, please refer to the previous video that it was uploaded just prior to this one. So that said, let's look at verse 8 again. After many days thou shalt be visited. God is speaking to Gog and Magog. And God said, after many days thou shalt be visited, after many days. That's a phrase that means a long time, okay? And that in itself wouldn't be indicative of a particular time in history or in the future, but we have this other clue in the next phrase. In the latter years, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Uh, against the mountains of Israel. Let's stop there. In the latter years. The latter years is a term that we see in the scripture which refers to the end of time or the time that is close to the end of time. We see the phrase the last days in the Bible many times. The last days refers to the last three of the seven days that comprise all of time. There are seven days that comprise all of time. Each day is a thousand years as it's written in the scripture. A thousand years is as one day to the Lord, and one day is a thousand years. It's written in Psalm 92 and also in 1 Peter chapter 3. Pardon me, 2 Peter chapter 3. So the last days is the last three days, which began when our Lord Jesus Christ went to the Father. And it's been two days since then, or almost two days since then, about 2,000 years. And then there remains another day, the last 1,000 years, the last day, which is called the day of the Lord, which is a thousand years when Jesus Christ will sit upon his throne. He will come again in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, destroy his enemies, sit upon his throne, which is the throne of his father, David, and he will rule over the land of Israel. And I spoke much about this in the previous video. So I'm going to digress. But that's the Lord's day. It's the seventh day. It's why God gave his people Israel the Sabbath. It's why God in the beginning sanctified the seventh day and hallowed it. And then when Israel became a nation, he gave them the commandment to rest on the seventh day. That's called a Sabbath. And it was a holy convocation. It was a, something, it was a, it was a type or shadow given under the law of something that shows 
something that God was going to do in the future. And that thing that God was going to do in the future is that he's going to send his son, Jesus Christ, to sit on the throne and reign for a thousand years until all his enemies are placed under the soles of his feet. As it is written, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Praise the Lord. So, this is going to happen in the latter years. The latter years is a phrase that refers to the last part of that seventh day. The last part of that seventh day. In the latter years, in the last part of that seventh day, there's something that's going to happen. Let's turn to, hold your place in Ezekiel chapter 38. Come with me to the Revelation in chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And thank you, by the way, again, for knowing that it's not Revelations. It doesn't have an S at the end. It's not plural. It's the Revelation. And it's called the Revelation because it's the, it's the Revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the first five words of the book, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. So in Revelation chapter 20, let's go to... Hallelujah. Verse 7. It says, and when the thousand years are expired, what thousand years? Okay, we need to back up a little bit. Let's go to verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Nay, you know what? To give understanding, let's just read the whole chapter from the beginning. Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. Okay? And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day, and one day as a thousand years. A thousand years is but as yesterday in thy sight, saith the scripture. So this thousand years is a day. It's the seventh day. It's the day of the Lord. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the reason that God gave Israel the Sabbath day on the seventh day of the week. Because Jesus is going to be sitting on his throne, ruling over all the world, including Israel. And the people of Israel are going to be living in their, in their land, on their land. And they're going to have the Spirit of God in them. And they're going to be worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And they're going to be keeping the law of Moses exactly as he gave it to them. Including all the animal sacrifices and the feast days and the Sabbath days and all that stuff. They're going to be keeping all that stuff with the Spirit of God in them. And they're going to keep it perfectly in order for God's name to be glorified, because they have blasphemed his name in all nations all over the world, profaned his name in all nations all over the world because of their disobedience. And in this way, the nations will behold the people of Israel, and they will know that God has scattered them all throughout the nations because of their disobedience, and that God did, at the end, exactly what he promised to do, even though they made it very difficult for him, that he will fulfill his promise that he made to Abraham and they will live in the land of Israel and they will keep the law as Moses gave it to them. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is talking about the saints, the church, those of us who are the bride of Christ right now. We will live and reign with Christ a thousand years. We will, be, we will live in that kingdom in glorified immortal bodies reigning with Jesus Christ. We will judge Israel, we will judge angels, and we will judge the nations. Instead of the wicked men and women that are sitting in positions of power and authority in countries and cities all over the world, it will be us, Jesus sitting in his throne in Jerusalem, and us, the saints, ruling as prime ministers and presidents and governors and mayors in every place all around the world. It will be the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ will be ruling on his throne, and we, his ministers, will be the prime ministers and presidents and governors and mayors and judges in the land all over the world. A thousand years. Praise the Lord. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is, I think, the third time that we've read a thousand years in this passage. So there can be no mistaking the fact that this day is going to be a thousand years. <laughs> Pardon me. This is the part that I wanted to call your attention to, which pertains to Ezekiel chapter 38. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, as we just read in verse 3. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And when the thousand years are expired, verse 7, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. This is the battle that is called the War of Gog and Magog. It's very clear. It says their names right here, Gog and Magog. Verse 8, again, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. The camp of the saints is what? Israel, the people of Israel. And we're going to see that as we go back to Ezekiel 38. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and let's start with verse 8 again. Ezekiel 38, verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited. God is speaking to Gog and Magog. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Okay, so now there's no mistaking what we're talking about, what God's talking about. It's Israel. It's not any other country. It's the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. The people of Israel right now, the people that live in the country called Israel right now, are living under the governorship of the synagogue of Satan. They fly the flag of Remphan, which is Molech, uh, that six-pointed blue hexagram on their flag is not the Star of David. It's the Star of Molech. Uh, they are worshiping the Canaanite gods. Um, they love the Canaanite gods. They hate the God of Israel, the people that are living in the land of Israel right now. They hate the God of Israel. They reject their Messiah. They hate his name, Yeshua. They hate his name. And they hate anybody who speaks his name because they're filled with devils. They hate God. See, this is not a nation who has been this is not the fulfillment of the scripture. This is not the nation that is brought back from the sword and gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. That's not talking about the people that are living in Israel right now, because they live under the Iron Dome, and they're being attacked by armies from, you know, well, right now from the, from the Israeli army, which is under the guise of Hamas. Um, the is for those of you who don't know, Hamas was created by Israel. They're a proxy army, just like Al Qaeda and ISIS were created by the U.S. CIA to be a proxy army. A proxy army is an army that is created by a government that has a, that operates under a, a different flag, a false flag, so that they can do things that they want to do without the blame coming to them. That's what a proxy army is. For those of you who, who don't realize that, so Hamas is a proxy army that was created by Israel decades ago. And now they're being used to create or facilitate this war. And this war is happening in, in a wicked nation that has nothing to do with this prophecy right here. Okay, This prophecy right here has to do with the time in the future when Jesus Christ, the son of David, will be sitting upon the throne of David in Jerusalem, reigning over all the earth. And the people of Israel will have been brought from all nations all over the earth to inhabit the land of Israel, and they will be filled with the Holy Ghost, and they will be keeping the law of Moses exactly as it was written, exactly as Jesus came to fulfill it. That's what they will be doing, and that's obviously not what's happening now in the land that is called Israel. It's the same land geographically, but that has nothing to do with this. The people that are living there right now, that's not these people that we're reading about in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 8 and 9. Okay, that's not those people. 
the people of Israel have not been gathered yet. That which is happening in the land of Israel right now is not by the hand of God having gathered his people of Israel from all over the world to the land of Israel to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and cause them to be all righteous. And as it is written in the scripture, the deliverer shall come to Zion and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That hasn't happened yet. That's not that. The thing that is happening in Israel for the last 50 or 60 years is a product of the of the evil designs of the globalist elite, the Satanists. And it was facilitated firstly by the, the British government in, in during the First World War, and then it was completed using the, their collaboration with the U.S. government during the Second World War, which is the reason why the United Nations was created after the Second World War. The Second World War was fought, and, and, and however many people died in the Second World War, died so that this illegal entity called the United Nations could be risen up to exercise hegemony over the basic, oh, pardon me, over the various nations of the world and pretend that they have some sort of authority to dictate to the nations what the nations should do. And it was through the United States government and the United Nations, an unlawful organization that elected itself to be the rulers of the world, they were the ones in, co in collaboration with the British government who created the state of Israel in 1948. They were the ones that did that. They did it for political reasons. It wasn't the hand of God. I'm not saying that they did it like apart from the hand of God, like God just said, oh no, what just happened? Uh, I must have took a nap. I didn't know. It wasn't like that. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that, that God had no part in it because God certainly allowed it. But it's allowed for the purpose of deception. It's allowed for the purpose of deception. Now, why would I say that about God? Well, God is the one who spoke in his word in, in, in the prophet Jeremiah. And he said, when a prophet is deceived, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Why would God say that? Because people love to be lied to. People love to be deceived. And one of the ways that the wicked are dealt with and filtered out is that God allows them to have what they want, which is deception. And so this whole thing about Israel being a nation since 1948 and the globalists, which are Satanists, the synagogue of Satan, teaching the people through the, the, the theological seminaries and the denominational churches that this all fits into prophecy. That's all a big deception and nothing more. It's, it's absolutely that 100%. I'm not wrong about it. It's all a deception. See, this is not the fulfillment of the prophecy of Israel being gathered from all nations into the land of Israel. See, and that's what the premise of the, the video before this was. So I'm going to digress and let you go back to that video if you want to learn more about that. But God is speaking in this particular chapter, 38, verses, verse 8 and following, about something that's going to happen in the future. Now let's read verse 8 again. After many days thou shalt be visited. Remember, God is speaking to Gog. Gog. God, with a D, is speaking to Gog with a G. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So, we've seen up to this point that that hasn't happened yet, it hasn't been fulfilled yet, but it will in the future. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. Israel will dwell safely in their land, and there won't be any more wars, because Jesus Christ is going to crush all the armies of the world. He's going to destroy all the weapons of war. There will be no more tanks. There will be no more bombs. There will be no more firearms. No more guns in the kingdom of God. No more weapons. Hallelujah. Now, let's continue. Verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. That's just what we read in the Revelation concerning in the end of the thousand years, in the end of the seventh day. Okay, right now we are towards the end of the sixth day because it's been about 2,000 years since our Lord Jesus Christ went to be with the Father and shed forth his Holy Spirit and the New Testament began 50 days after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost. So it's been about 2,000 years since then. We don't know exactly how many years it's been because the Romans changed the calendar so many times that I don't believe anybody, at least not in the general population of this world, knows what year it is. Um, that's why I a lot of times speak the year that is is uh, indicated by the Hebrew calendar when I speak the date. <coughs> Pardon me. As I said in the beginning of this video, it's 2024, 5784. I, uh, I, don't, I can't speak with 100% surety that the Hebrew calendar is accurate, but I tend to believe that it is. 
and I tend to have a lot more confidence in the Hebrew calendar than I do in the Roman calendar. Uh, but I digress from that. Um, we can see from verse from verses 8 and 9 here that this is exactly what was being described in the Revelation chapter 20, as we just read it a few minutes ago. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of what? Unwalled villages. Israel shall be a land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. Israel shall be a nation at rest, that will be dwelling safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. This is obviously not talking about the nation of Israel as it is today. Obviously not. It cannot be no possible way. Let's continue. To take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. The people that are gathered out of the nations. This is talking about the people of Israel that shall be gathered out of the nations to live in the land of Israel, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, all of them, because God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, when he said that in Joel 2.28, he wasn't talking about the whole world. He was talking about the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. If you read that passage in its context, you will see that. He was talking about the nation of Israel. And when that happens, when Jesus Christ comes to sit on his throne and the people of Israel are gathered from all nations to live in that land, God will pour out his Spirit upon all flesh in the land of Israel. And all the people of Israel shall be filled with the Holy Spirit and serve God in spirit and in truth. Let's continue in verse 12. Which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Praise the Lord. Let's skip a little bit for sake of time, but I highly recommend that you read both of these chapters in their entirety. Let's go down to verse 21. God says, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Against him, Gog. Gog and Magog. The chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Now I'm turning back to the Revelation chapter 20. I just want to refresh our memories. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Okay, Revelation chapter 20 verse 9. So this that we're reading in Ezekiel chapter 38 is obviously exactly the same thing as we read about in Revelation chapter 20 verses uh, 7 through 9. Okay, let's read that again. And when the thousand years are expired, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, specifically mentioned, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So we read up to Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 21. Let's read verses, verse 22 and following. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. This is going to happen in the end of the seventh day. Now in the 39th chapter, we can see that this, this same war is going to happen and that the people of Israel are going to be seven years in burning all the weapons that these people will have made, this army will have made. All these weapons are, will have been made of wood, bows and arrows and spears and, 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 and hand staves and shields. All these things will have been made of wood and of metal, but I mean, there won't be 
nuclear bombs. There won't be helicopters. There won't be rifles. There won't be pistols. There won't be anything like that. Because Jesus will have destroyed all that out of the land. And when the devil comes forth to deceive the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog and all the hordes that are with him, they're going to make weapons, but they're not going to be able to make bombs and airplanes to drop them with. And, you know, Apache attack helicopters and all that stuff. Because all that stuff will have long been destroyed for many centuries. And so many people will say, well, well, Ezekiel just didn't know what an, attack, uh, what a, what an Apache attack helicopter was, so he, he called it bows and arrows. Well, really? <laughs> Seriously? I mean, what kind of an idiot would believe a story like that? The scripture doesn't say that. So let's start in, in, in chapter 39. Let's just read a little bit. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts. There again is the reference to the north parts. And will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Now some people might say, well, that's just a parable, and it's just a, you know, it's a parabolic meaning saying that, you know, God will cast his weapons out of his hand. Okay, that might be possible. Let's just continue on. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give unto thee the ravenous birds of every, pardon me, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. That's exactly what we read in the Revelation. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. Praise the Lord. Now let's continue on. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire. I'm in verse 9, chapter 39, verse 9. And shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears. And they shall burn them with fire seven years. So now we know that the bow and arrow was not a parabolic statement concerning, you know, a, a mythical entity and the bow and arrow just meaning you know, a weapon of war or whatever. These are literal bows and arrows made of wood. And the people of Israel are going to be burning them for seven years. They won't need any firewood. The whole nation of Israel will not need any firewood for seven years because of the, the magnitude of the multitude of people that will have set themselves against them round about like the sand of the sea, all with weapons made of wood and metal like spears, well, you know, with the, the head of the spear being metal and arrow, you know, arrow tips being made of metal, uh, arrowheads, I guess they're called, pardon me, made, made of metal and, you know, wood and metal. And that's it. The, the weapons are going to be made of wood. There's not going to be any tanks. There's not going to be any B-52 bombers. There's not going to be any nuclear silos and nuclear weapons and ICBMs. There's not going to be any of that because all those things will have long been destroyed for many centuries. So we know that this war cannot possibly be one that is going to take place right now in this time or in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. This war is not going to take place before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because it is our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes who is going to destroy all the weapons of war, all the weapons of mass destruction that men have made for themselves at the advice of devils, by the way. That's fallen angel technology, all that stuff. Man didn't invent that stuff. Don't pat yourself on the back, human, because you didn't invent that stuff. All that stuff was given to you by the fallen angels. So, all those things will have been destroyed. This war, this war of Gog and Magog, cannot possibly, according to the scripture, according to the abundant testimonies of the scripture over and over and over, it cannot possibly be something that's going to happen in the near future from now. It's something that's going to happen over a thousand years from now. During a time when the people of Israel will have been gathered together from all nations all over the world to live in the land of Israel, and they will be filled with the Holy Ghost, and they will not be waving the flag of Remphan. They will be serving God. They will know that Jesus is their Messiah, and he will be sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, ruling over them, and his bride ruling with him over them. And 
at the end of that thousand years, these hordes that are going to be raised up against Israel, when the devil goes out to deceive the four quarters of the earth to bring the nations against Israel in one last ditch effort to try to escape his fate, all these people are going to be making weapons out of wood and they're going to be riding on horses. They're not going to be in tanks and jets and attack helicopters. And there's going to be no ICBMs and no, no nuclear weapons, no bombs whatsoever, not even a firecracker. There's not going to be anything like that. So we can see that this battle that's going to happen is going to happen in the future over a thousand years from now. And it cannot possibly be referring to anything that's going to happen in our lifetime or even before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot possibly be. So the people that are believing that the that the that the invented war the 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 what what's the word that I'm looking for right now the um I can't think of the word right now but the war that's being invented right now and perpetrated for the purpose of political reasons to try to save the so-called elite from uh, being convicted and 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 punished for their crimes that has nothing to do with this and it's not going to lead to this you see so stop letting these false prophecy teachers take one or two verses out of the scripture and twist them around and cause you to think that the Gog and Magog war is something that's going to happen in our lifetime or even before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back because it's not. It's not. It's just not going to happen before our Lord Jesus Christ comes back. It's going to happen clearly according to the scripture. It's going to happen after the Lord Jesus Christ will have been on the earth reigning on the throne of David for almost a thousand years. That's when that war is going to happen and not before. This is what the testimony of the scripture says. We could go on and on. Uh, I could finish to the end of the chapter and show you many more evidences, but we've seen enough. But I highly recommend that you just at least take the time to read these two chapters, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. What will it take you? Five minutes? Ten minutes if you read slowly? And it will show you exactly what I'm saying, and especially compared with that passage in the 20th chapter of the Revelation, along with many other parts of the scripture. Of course, we only just looked at a couple because I didn't want to make this video too long. I've been speaking for almost 50 minutes so far. And I really didn't intend to make this video this long, but I needed to, to emphasize certain points to let you all know that you're being deceived in the mainstream churches, that these people are lying to you. These same people that are telling you that this Gog and Magog war is going to happen any day now, and that the war in Israel with Gaza is leading up to that, which is ridiculous nonsense. These same people that are telling you this are the same people that are telling you that God is three persons and that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation and a seven-year peace treaty with the, the Antichrist and a rapture and all of that foolishness and nonsense that if you would search the scriptures, you would know that all these things are deceptions. So again, what I say all the time is what I'm going to say again in closing of this video. Jesus said, it's written in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if you're still here with me at the end of this video, and you've heard this message, then you know what you need to do. You need to stop going to church. You need to stop watching YouTube videos. You need to stop reading books about the Bible. Stop listening to all these false prophecy teachers. And get alone with God, with your King James Bible, and start seeking Him in His Word. That's where you will find the truth. That's where, you will learn, that's where you will learn to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And nowhere else. Praise the Lord. May these things be a blessing to those who have ears to hear. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.